Yeah, thank you and thanks very much for, for um, hosting me again. It's great to be back in, in, in North America and to see so many old, so many new faces. Um, however, we're talking about Eurasia this time, different species. A lot of historical parallels, as you'll see, my talk even finishes with a plug for a book. <laughs> so here we are. This is Europe at night. Um, oops. Gerhard lived down here in one of the fairly well lit bits. I'm lucky enough to live up there. And beaver distribution used to be more or less inversely correlated with the intensity of light and indeed the intensity of human population. But beavers are now into these areas. It's going to cause us some challenges in the path in the future. But we'll start off a long way in the past during the last ice age. Now at the moment we're in Baltimore, which is on roughly the same latitude as Lisbon in Spain, which is there on that map. And here in North America, the um, latitudinal zones, the, the mountains, tend to go north-south. And as the ice came, it's fairly easy for the vegetational zones to shift south and then shift north in parallel. It's not like that in Eurasia. If you see, down about that level, which is where the, the forest zone was, in, was pushed down into Spain and Italy in the west, then there's the Mediterranean Sea, which stops it from going any further. Further east, you've got the Himalayas and the Tian Shan mountain ranges. Any um, vegetational zones moving south there get pressed against that, which is already tundra. And the only other place where it's possible for beavers to move south into a refuge would be in the east here, over in what is now China, where there is vegetational zones could move south and there was an area of woodland in the past. So back then, beavers were having really quite a hard time in Eurasia because the amount of habitat available to them had been reduced very, very greatly. So here again is the vegetation top left and the rest of the map shows data from Mar et al. 2018 on, on fossil DNA. The red spots are a particular clade of, of beavers, a subspecies, you could say. The blue are another spot, and the green are a third. The Danube clade, which is now extinct. And what appears to have happened is that the conditions of the Ice Age split the refugia for, for beavers into a western one in what is now Spain and Portugal. A central refuge in the Danube and in Greece to the south, uh, all of which is now extinct. And an Ice Age refuge in the east, probably around the Volga Caspian Basin. And after the Ice Age, the mammals moved north uh, and east through the river systems, colonizing the whole of Europe. And the traces are evident in very many mammal species and in beavers. You have what you can call the east and the west balance. But also there's this possible Far East refuge in Yellow River, Yangtze Basin area. There is so far no fossil DNA from anywhere east of Lake Baikal, or indeed um, any DNA data of any kind. Though a couple of weeks ago I was talking or emailing Alexander Savelyev, who is the, the grand old man of beavers in, in, in the Russian Federation, and he dropped a hint to the effect that they're doing this now and there are going to be some very interesting results, but he wouldn't tell me what they were. So um, bear in mind that this is a fast moving area and there may be some, some surprises in the future. So the DNA that we know at the moment looks like this. You've got the Western clade, the uppercase letters here are ancient DNA, and the lowercase letters are, are modern living animals. There's a Scandinavian semi-offshoot, that's the Norwegian beavers, 
the extinct Danube clade at the top there, and then the eastern clade, which is everything else so far as we know. And so how did that translate out after the end of the Ice Age and when we got in to the uh, essentially modern climatic conditions? This is our best guess for the moment. It's, it's less definite, less concrete than, than, than for North America. The red areas are bits where the evidence is pretty good. There were beavers there in the past, either through historical records or for, from post-Ice Age fossils. The yellow area with the question marks are areas where the biogeography would suggest there really shouldn't have been any problem for beavers colonizing into them, but we have no actual data that they were ever there. But they are mostly rather remote areas, and uh, it could just be a, a lack of, of people checking. And the double question marks are areas, again, where biogeography seems okay, but that um, there are reasons why beaver may never have colonized. So in Ireland in the West, for example, we know that all sorts of woodland animals made it over there when the land bridge was intact, things like badgers and red squirrels and so on. And since beavers can live right up to the limits of, the, of uh, bushy growth on, in the tundra, there doesn't seem any reason why they couldn't have spread into Ireland, but there, there are no physical remains, so um, we can't be sure. In the southwest of Europe, there are again a couple of places in the far south where there isn't any data, and there the, the habitat's very chopped up and fragmented. But it's also a place that, that um, Bronze Age, Iron Age people got to very early, and uh, the dissected nature of the habitat could mean beavers went extinct very early. A possibility I think we need to consider is in the east of Asia, a number of the species there, brown bears and moose, for example, are more closely related to the North American uh, clades than they are to ones further west in Europe. So it's kind of an open question at the moment as to whether the beavers there might have been canadensis or might have been a third species living, cycling north and south into the Yangtze and uh, Yellow River basins with the various ice ages. Uh, that can only really be sorted out through, through fossil DNA. It's perfectly easy to study, and with any luck, it will be, be solved fairly soon. Down in China, again, the Yangtze River, sorry, the Yellow River Basin in the north there, the big um, pinkish area with the double question mark on it, there doesn't seem to be any biogeographical reason why they couldn't have spread over from the Amur River, where we know they were historically, but that's the cradle of Chinese civilization and it's a very active river with very light soils. Uh, so it's possible that beavers went extinct there a long, long time ago and then never, uh, and we'd never be able to find any, any um, remains of it. It's also probably worth pointing out in the far top right of the map there, the Anadur Basin, that used to run into a river that um, ran into Beringia and it, ha it was reported to have beavers in it by an expedition in the, in the 1850s. If that's true, it seems more likely than not that those would have been canadensis rather than fever. So if we move on into the Holocene period, these are the data we have for where beavers were known to be extant into the Iron Age and, and later in the far south. They were all over Iberia. They were certainly in northern Italy, and they were found in the Euphrates uh, Valley and uh, in what is the, uh, in modern Turkey. And it appears that beavers remained a reasonably familiar animal to, to, most, to most people, or at least in most cultures, right through into about six, 700 years ago on the left there's an Iranian bestiary on beavers from around about 1300 uh, in which the animals are described and hunting techniques uh, outlined. And on the right, there's a woodcut from a, a book called The Garden of Health, which was printed in Strasbourg in uh, the German-French border in 1497. 
So it seems through this period, through to the, what's usually called the medieval period, beavers, the population was probably much reduced, but they were still pretty widespread. So for example, if you look at older books about Britain, they say beavers went extinct in Saxon times, but a few years ago, um, an observant uh, friend of mine found this stick in a sediment in a very unlikely stream, very steep up in the top, up in the mountains on the Scottish English border, which was dated to about 1350 or so, and it turned out to be chewed probably by a juvenile beaver. So beavers were there at that time, and documentary evidence also indicates that in England there was a bounty paid out for them in the times of Henry VIII, and they paid a much bigger bounty for otters, so they were aware of the distinction between the species. Um, and a bounty was paid out as late as 1790, but you have to be a little careful as to the, the veracity of that one. And throughout Europe, beavers appear to have been widespread, most places scarce. The last beaver records for Italy were for 1540, for Spain in the 1600s, and for virtually everywhere else in Europe into the 19th century. There are these small populations mostly surviving in big marshy areas where it was um, hard to find them. So beavers remain pretty widespread through to that time, but then pretty much exactly coincident with the move into North America by Europeans, this event happened. This was an outright invasion of a sovereign nation by a neighboring sovereign nation for the purpose of getting control of their fur. The nation in, uh, is, was known as the Canate of Sibir. That is Sibir, the town in the background from which the whole of Siberia takes its name. It was run by the Mongols, an offshoot of Genghis Khan's Golden Horde, who used to extract tribute from the Russians on the left and were still extracting tribute from the Siberian peoples of the Khanate of, Sib of Sibir in the form of furs, a system known as the Yasak system. Now, this group of Cossacks, working probably on behalf of the Stroganov Fur Company, possibly a bunch of people so troublesome that they were told to go over there to get rid of them, crossed the Urals, conquered uh, Sibir in 1582, and then uh, Yermak, the guy in armour in the middle, went straight to the Tsar with 2,400 marten pelts and 2,500 beaver pelts and said, look what I've got. And this was a language the Tsar understood. He sent him back with some Russian regular troops and a suit of armor in which Yermak subsequently drowned in the River Ob when the uh, locals um, chucked him out of his boat. It took his successors 20 whole years to finally subdue Sibir, which is the whole of the area drained by the Ob River and um, to the right of the Ural Mountains that you see on the left of the map there, between the tundra and the steppe zone. They got control of it, and then they set up a system based entirely in its origins on the Mongol protection racket. And that's all you can call it. Unlike trading with the Indians, this was extracting money with menaces. What they would do is they would arrive in an area like this, Mangazea, up in the northern part of this region, set up a fort, that's where the Tsar's men lived, unlike um, North America, this wasn't essentially private enterprise. This was the autocratic state in league with fur trappers. The fort is where the Yasak was kept, the fur tribute. It's also where the various hostages that they generally took from the local population to ensure that they came up with the Yasak were kept. The fur traders lived in the, the town to the right and the um, produce was moved by boat through the river system. Now, about a quarter of what was extracted from the area appears to have been Yasak, essentially you know, um, forced tribute from the local Siberian tribes, and about three quarters was trapped or traded by Russians. So what you've got here is the, the fur records in rubles as to what 
for the YASAC, the tribute system. With uh, really only one exception here at Tobolsk, that's the second column, where the numbers appear to hold up, everywhere else, as the century goes on, the numbers are declining fast, despite the fact that fur prices are rising and general inflation in rubles. And this is, of course, the reason that you can already guess. It's because they were trapping out everything. Tobolsk, it appears to hold up, but that's really only an artifact of all the other Yasak being funneled through Tobolsk on its way back to European Russia. So what do you do? You've already depleted the fur trade in European Russia. You've gotten hold of the original canate of Siberia, and you've trapped out all the furs there too. The system just keeps going very fast as well. It conquers this enormous area right through to modern Alaska uh, within about two human generations, establishes the same system everywhere, except down here. As you see from the colors, it was relatively later on, because there they ran into the Chinese, who also had gunpowder, and at that time were under a strong uh, dynasty, the Mings, who were able to, um, uh, to successfully resist the Russians, and by a treaty called the Treaty of Nerchinsk, they delineated their areas, and that lasted through to the, the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And even back in the 12th, 13th centuries, for example, the inhabitants, the then inhabitants of Hokkaido, the Ainu people, were trading long distance furs up round Sakhalin and up the Amur River to the major Chinese trading spot near what is now Khabarovsk. It's worth saying that that part of the map was only ever theoretically Russian. And I was interested to see in the previous talk the uh, map of the North American fur trade going into almost exactly that area. Trading posts went south as far as California, based on the Russian system. But by 1867, the place was a trapped out liability and sold off to the Americans, very unpopular with most Americans at the time. It appeared to be a complete waste of money. It was known as Seward's Folly. And there was also a large Yankee fur trade to China in the 19th century. Now, all of this was conducted across the river routes. It's quite an extraordinary piece of, of logistics. If you imagine a, a North American beaver or a sea otter trapped in, in Alaska, it would come across the Pacific down the Aleutian chain, be landed here, a place called Okotsk, transported over the mountains into the headwaters of the Lena system, sailed across the Lena system, portaged again into the Angara, the upper part of the Yenisei system, over into the Ob, eventually through to Bolsk, and then it all went over the mountains again into the Volga River system, and so to Moscow. It was actually illegal to sail it round here. The reason being that it was all too likely that anyone doing that would meet Dutch and um, English ships out there and do a little side trading. And the Tsar was very, very keen on making sure that he got his cut. So everything had to go through Moscow. And it was a serious cut. On the left there is the fur market in Irbit. This is in 1913 after three centuries of no holds barred, no quota limits exploitation of the system. That's not a big trading post. And the, uh, the, the fur supply there is, is really very large. Multiply that by a couple of orders of magnitude at least for the annual production of the whole of the, of the region. And then from there, once it got into European Russia, it was generally traded on into Europe, in particular to the fur market at Leipzig, which was absolutely enormous in its time. And what the Russians were wanting in the early stages were they were wanting firearms and gunpowder and they were wanting gold and silver, all of which was to finance the construction of the autocratic Russian state. 
They needed the fur to get that, and they needed the gunpowder, of course, to um, enforce their system in Siberia and elsewhere. And as we've heard in previous talks and is generally known, it was the market for, for hats rather more than the, than the uh, animal as a food item that was important. At the same time, the oriental fur market from Siberia never really ended. The picture here is from the international concession in Shanghai in the 1930s, and at the bottom right there you can see the, a copy of the Oriental Fur Trade Review for September 1927. So the result of all of this, this was an autocratic state enforcing fur collection on a close to global scale for the purpose of keeping itself going as an autocratic state and a power. This was an empire literally built on fur. The result of which was an enormous collapse in populations. The species, just like in North America, became extinct over vast areas. And what you see here, the circles are all of the known refugia for the species. There was nothing east of the upper Yenisei Apparently, east of Lake Baikal, the species was completely extinct. And only these eight refuges to the west, a few small ones in Western Europe, most of them in places where beaver could live very unobtrusively, like in the Rhone Delta, where they didn't need to cut down trees, they didn't need to build dams, they lived in burrows, so they could live, as it were, under the radar, but down to very low populations. We think around about 1,200 animals total. Um, a question was asked in the last uh, talk about DNA. There is some data from Eurasian beavers indicating that genetic bottlenecking is indeed a factor in their biology. For example, Norwegian provenance DNA, they are practically monomorphic in many areas of their genome, and in particular in the area that's responsible for um, the immune system. So Norwegian provenance beavers may be very, very susceptible to some disease. If one of them can get it, they can all get it. And there are genetic abnormalities in the, the teeth of the L provenance beavers. So that's our lowest point though we think probably that there was one more refuge that was not known about at the time somewhere in what's now modern Poland or eastern Germany because that appears to best explain some of the DNA evidence. So that's where we hit bottom in the early 20th century. The first known reintroduction of beavers anywhere was in the modern Czech Republic and it was in 1880, 1800. The beavers there lived until 1876, but there were then no reintroductions for over a century. So really the history of reintroduction gets going with protection in the 1900s and then the first wave of beaver releases, the 20s to the 50s. The purpose then was to bring back a commercially very valuable species for its fur, its castorium, its meat. Now, beavers are expensive to breed in captivity and they take a long time to reach size. So the idea was to release beavers with the purpose of producing a harvestable surplus in the wild. And there were a couple of other little introductions about that time, essentially as an ornament to, to, to rich man's estates. So how do you get beavers? You have them. Well, as you've seen, the Russian state system is thorough and operates on a large scale. And even though by this time they were communists, that particular trait did not change. And this is the beaver breeding center in Voronezh in Russia, where they bred lots of them. There were no inhibitions then about um, possibly habituating them to humans. And they were bred on a large scale, taken care of in close contact with their mothers and well-fed, part of the reason being that not all beavers will survive, especially when you've got 
things like that living in the rivers of Russia. <laughs> then there's a second wave, 50s to the 1990s. There the purpose was bringing back an extinct species, not, not for hunting, but as an end in itself. And there the, the main scene of activity moved to Western Europe, in Switzerland, France, Austria. The Austrians released uh, some C. canadensis, but those appear to have gone extinct in competition with castor fever. Also East Germany, Netherlands, West Germany, Czech Republic. So things are starting to move around about this time, and this takes us into the time of the early conferences. They're back now, and one of the things is that they're now back in enough parts of Western and Central Europe that people are now able to see the effects. So here is a, a beaver dam in the heavily cultivated um, landscape of the area, and they've brought back biodiversity, and they change and develop the landscape, and there are now a lot of examples about. And that's part of the reason leading to the third wave, which is beavers as providers of ecosystem services. And there, the explicit goal, and now we're moving into what used to be called Eastern Europe, but they much prefer to be called Central Europe, Croatia, Romania, Hungary, places like that in the, in the post-communist uh, post period, releasing them into river systems with the explicit purpose of improving the ecosystem services that these areas provide. And this continues in places like Belgium, Spain, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, where there was a political motive in the immediate aftermath of the, of the civil war there. This was one of the few uncontroversial things they could think of to do. It was very difficult to say that this was a, a Bosniak or a Serb or a Croat beaver. It was a Bosnian Herzegovina beaver. So it was even on the stamps. And it reached um, Scotland as well, which is, is the, the country of my birth, where they were released in the west on a peninsula, but about the same time, a population which seems to be descended from escapes was found to be living on the Tay watershed. And now we're finally, just now, in just the last decade, entering what you could call the fourth wave. It's to bring back the beaver to benefit people and save money. For example, to Mongolia, where the explicit purpose was to restore groundwater tables and clean water from arable lands. And there are now a beavers even living in, in England, wild. Population of unknown origin was present on the River Otter since around 2008, and originally it was planned to remove them, but it changed its mind. Uh, following local pressure and to do, for com do with complex political reasons. And a trial was underway, and that trial, in fact, ends this month. And there are also known to be beavers established in the wild on at least two other rivers in England and one on the English-Welsh border. So if we visualise this by, by decade, as you can see, as the decades go on, the... the balance of where they're being reintroduced tends to change down to the south and west in very broad terms and into more and more heavily populated country until in the 2010s it reaches what you might call the most primitive and reluctant part of Europe in this respect, England. But there perhaps I show some bias. Um, and the pattern is characteristic very rapid spread. This is from Sweden, but you see it over and over again when they get into a new river system. Very rapid area spread, but only followed after a time lag by a very rapid increase in populations, probably because in these big river systems, they're just not finding each other in the early stages. They're dispersing out, not finding a mate, keeping moving, and that depresses the population growth for a while until it reaches a certain critical point, and then off you go. And you can see it here, the big lines here are the watershed divides. Beavers get into a watershed in a given decade. They're throughout it by the decade after that, and then they fill in after that, occupying 
progressively less attractive habitat from a beaver's point of view as they go. And the early sites are strongly associated with deciduous forest, rich grass and forb layers, relatively deep water, places you don't have to dam, low gradient depositional landforms. Not at all the high ground that they were produced to as, as a refuge, it's a refugee habitat in the old days. Uh, this is a couple of places in Norway just showing the effect of watershed divides, even a small area. It so happens that I live there, where there is a tiny cross, it's rather hard to see, uh, right beside a lake. Two kilometers away, there are beavers, been there for several decades, but they haven't made it across the hill into the lake next to my house yet. Uh, so even quite small watershed divides are a serious barrier to movement, though they are eventually, of course, crossed. So in 2015, the management framework across Europe looked like this. Game animal in large regions, protection with nuisance animal control in other regions, protection, monitor trials, and even a policy of extermination in Spain, which we'll get back to. Just now, Poland's considering what's called a derogation from the EU Habitats Directive, which protects beavers to permit game animal status. In Scotland, it went over from trial to protected with a very liberally applied nuisance animal control policy from last year. In England, the trial period was agreed in 2015 and is ending this month. Uh, but in Spain, in 2018, the EU changed its position. It had previously ruled that these were not autochthonous animals to the river system and that they had gotten there without due process. The second part is true. And, but they said they are, are autochthonous and the population is protected by the Habitats Directive. And the regional governments there are trying to work out how they're going to apply that in principle if they do at all. Oops, excuse me. So the population in 2000 looked roughly like that in distribution. By 2016, by which time myself and Gerhard had gotten data from, from Russia, hence the sudden arrival of European Russia in this map, considerable expansion. This is the latest map. And over in Asia, it looks like this. And we've done roundups of population. This is really just by adding the minimum population estimate from each country, and the quality of these numbers varies wildly, but the overall trend is entirely clear. We think there were about 400,000 in 1998, and our latest estimate in a paper we'll be submitting later this month is that there are about 130, there's about 1 million, sorry, 1,350,000. So they've about tripled over that period. And it's leading to a number of management issues. The American beaver was, was introduced to, to um, Eastern Finland in the 1920s. At the time, people didn't understand the distinction. And at the same time, they also introduced some, some beavers from Norway. Down in the southwest, the North American beaver is gaining at the expense of the Eurasian beaver, but that's a very inbred population. It may have something to do with it, because over near St. Petersburg, what used to be Leningrad, just over the border, the Eurasian beavers, which are descended from much more genetically diverse eastern stocks, are gaining at the expense of the Canadian beavers. So the competition here is, is what, what makes one species or other win is, is by no means clear. But both species are now invading the whole of Finnish Lapland up in the north there in the Kemi River system uh, from different directions. Sea fever's coming in from Sweden and Canadensis is spreading from populations further south. It would be a good management idea since the Finns define the Canadian beaver as an uh, unwanted invasive species 
if they were to attempt to tip the balance on this river system by removing as many of the Canadian beavers as possible and encouraging castor fever. If they don't, there will, I suppose, be a fascinating ecological experiment as enormous numbers of these beavers meet in a totally flat landscape with a very uniform and very dense amount of beaver habitat. But personally, I prefer that the experiment were not tried and that we try to load the dice in the favour of castor fever. Over in Spain, the beaver population descends, it appears, from 18 individuals that were introduced near the Ebro-Aragon confluence in 2003. Now, the Spanish authorities have chained a derogation from the EU Habitats Directive, which allowed them to attempt extermination. Uh, mostly on the grounds that this was done without due process and that that is not, uh, that it was therefore unfair. They trapped out 216 beavers, mostly early in the period, um, but as was predictable and indeed predicted by me and others, they failed to remove every single beaver. It's very hard to do in modern conditions. They spent several hundred thousand euros on doing it and it doesn't appear to have had any significant effect. They took out 216 beavers, but the population in Navarra alone was estimated by the regional authorities as 450 to 650. I don't know their methods, and that looks a very high number to me, though if you do the math, it is just about possible. If it's true, then in the whole Ebro system, there must be more than a thousand individuals by now, and two years ago, the environment directorate reversed its position said that beavers were historically extant on the Ebro, which is entirely true, and therefore protected by the Habitats Directive. No more trapping, but the status in regional law, and it's the regional governments, Navarre, Aragon, Catalonia, that are responsible in Spanish law, it remains unclear. This is a map of population densities in, in Europe, and it looks very similar to that map of Europe with the lights on that you saw at the beginning. The denser the population, the more street lights, of course. Beavers are now moving in to these most densely populated regions of Europe, which are heavily engineered by humans, for the most part dead flat, and with human population densities in excess of 500 to 1,000 people per square kilometre. And this is going to pose a number of challenges. The, the, the case study that's, that's best worked out is the Netherlands, where you can see there are beavers in much of the country now, including this area up here. That is a polder. The populations are increasing very rapidly. And here is the same place, the polder I just pointed out to you. It's totally artificial habitat reclaimed from the sea. It's dead flat. It's about 20 to 30 feet below sea level. In this picture here, it's that area on the right of picture. This is it internally. Flat, dead straight ditches, beavers throughout the area. And they've adapted very well. They're resourceful animals when you leave them alone. This looks to begin with, a little worrying, a beaver trapped in a, a, a concrete ditch, um, sitting lonely by the side. But that actually is a giant um, lock which gets things down from sea level onto the river level of the River Rhine, whole ships. And that beaver is in the habit of commuting through this lock. It swims in when a ship goes in, gets raised or lowered, and then swims out to the other half of its home range. It's having a great time. But it is also doing a few things that are conflictual with, with human activities, or the beavers generally are. But the Dutch are dealing with this really pretty well. They've brought out a lot of materials. There's a whole CD and literature on the subject, how to deal with beavers, how to adapt to having them in the landscape. And they've been even doing things like removing bits of concrete cladding from the sides of some of the canals to allow the beavers to get in and out and to form, to form um, uh, places where burrows or lodges can be built. So that's where we are now in 2020. 
That's our best guess as to where we're going to be in about 10 years' time. It's, we're really hitting the rapid increase phase in much of the densely populated parts of Europe. And if we extrapolate our numbers onwards, not nearly year 15 million yet, but going up rapidly would be something getting on for one and three quarter million if it continues. So what are we going to do about this? What is our future? There are 44 nations involved. Are we going to have to reinvent the wheel 44 times? Or are we going to make our own mistakes? Not entirely unlikely. The best way to deal with this, it seems to me, is to transfer knowledge horizontally inside Europe, an EU or EU plus beaver network. We need to transfer knowledge inside countries from wildlife professionals to land managers and the public. And we also need to bring in the state of the art from North America. You guys are about half a century ahead of us in the process of beaver population development and you've had time and the skill and ingenuity to develop a number of, of good solutions. Here's one good solution, uh, which I have so far failed to import professionally to Europe, but I'm still working on it. That's Skip Lyle and also Rachel Mallison, who works on, on fish. And I met her at the last conference I attended seven years ago. I was able to get funding for her to come to Norway for two years. It turned into three and a half years because she had a couple of kids in the meantime. Uh, and we've now published our very first paper on the subject to do with exactly the species, the Atlantic salmon, the brown trout. And that came out last week. And of course, we'll end with a plug for a book. This is the Eurasian Beaver Handbook, written by Roisin Campbell Palmer, who is in the audience with a lot of other people, including myself, Skip, and Derek. Just to say thank you very much for your attention, and do please buy our book. Thank you. <laughs>